All right, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Job 30, uh, 38, if you will. Job chapter 38. So just by way of introduction, of course, if you're familiar with the book of Job, uh, you had a man named Job, the Bible says, was a righteous man, and God allowed Satan to try Job, to tempt Job. And Job, of course, most of the book is his dialogue with these three friends of his who, um, who were accusing him of being an evil, wicked person. Of course, we know Job was not an evil, wicked person. They, of course, did not apparently understand the concept that God, not every time something bad happens to someone is a judgment of God. Sometimes it can just be God testing or trying someone. But Job got a little out of hand. Job gets to the point where, and you can see this happen throughout the book as it goes on, where Job starts to get a little high-minded. He starts to uh, almost blame God, in a sense, for, for what's happening to him. And God comes to Job, and before he deals with his three friends, he kind of sets Job straight a little bit. That's what the next couple chapters are about. And so, as we are here in Job chapter 38, uh, let's go ahead and start in verse 4. Verse 4, Job 38, verse 4. The Bible says, God speaking to Job, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. This verse is essentially the whole chapter. This is, God is basically talking to Job and putting him in his place and saying, do you, do you know who I am, Job? Can you do what I can do? Can, can you, do you know what I know? And so the title of the sermon this evening is Inferior. And I want to show us three different areas that we are inferior to God and most importantly, how that applies to us and what we can uh, do with our lives because of that. And there, uh, you don't have to turn there, but let me read you Isaiah 55 verse 8 where God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So this evening, the first way we are inferior to God is in knowledge. Is in knowledge. Verse 36 in Job 38, if you want to look there, says, Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who hath, put, who hath given understanding to the heart? In verse 18, God says, Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. So God is making the point here in one of the areas that, you know, Job, you are inferior, inferior to me in knowledge. You know nothing compared to what I know. And we would all agree with this this evening, but you say, okay, but what, what does that matter for me? What is that, uh, how do I apply that to my life? Well, if we know this is true, if we know this is true that we are inferior to God, specifically in knowledge, then why do we see uh, so many people running, people who are believers, people who are saved, running to other sources of knowledge other than the Word of God. Yeah. And look, I'm not saying that there's not a good experience out there, good knowledge about, uh, out there uh, um, by people that um, are maybe not even saved. I'm not saying there's not good books you can read and things like this. But as a Christian, you, it should never be able to be said to you that the first place you go for knowledge and instruction is somewhere other than the Bible. We always, if we really believe this is true, if we really believe that we are so inferior, all, all mankind is so inferior, inferior to God in knowledge, the Bible and the Word of God should be the first place that we go for instruction in our lives. Why so often do people go to wisdom, that, that, all wisdom it seems, all wisdom from all sorts of places except for God? Turn to uh, uh, keep your place there in Job chapter 38. So that's the first way we're in fear to God is in knowledge, and there's some things we can apply there. But the second way this evening from Job 38 that we are inferior to God is in power. Uh, there's too many verses to read here in Job 38, but I'm going to read you a couple. Verse 12, God says, Hast thou commanded the morning? Verse 35 says, God says, Canst thou send lightnings? Over and over in this chapter, God is, is asking Job, he's like, can you do all these things? Can, can you, can you, can you uh, exercise this great power like I can? You don't have to turn there. Uh, but Psalm 115.3 says, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Look, we can't do that. We can't say that about ourselves. Turn to 2 Kings 17. Keep your place there in Job, but turn to 2 Kings 17. Jeremiah 32, 17, I'll just read for you, says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. You can't say that about us. You can't say that uh, there is nothing too hard for us. All throughout history, man, no matter how advanced technology is, mankind has been pushing the limits of both, the, both himself and the machines he creates. Why? Because man has limits. 
Man cannot do, uh, there, there's, there's plenty of things that are too hard for mankind. So how does this apply to us? Well, we know that God has great power. So as a Christian, make sure you're on the right side of that power. Here, here's what I mean about that. God's power, you can be in one or two spots if you're saved. You can be saved and God's power can be on your side. It can be protecting you. It can be fighting for you. It can be winning battles in your life. Or you can be saved and be in sin and that same power will be fighting against you. That same power will be, uh, be, be against you in your life. It will be chastising you. It will be punishing you. So what side of that power do you want to be on? You're there in 2 Kings 17. Look at verse 36. I think this is a beautiful illustration of this. 2 Kings 17 verse 36, the Bible says, But the Lord, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, with, notice this, great power, and a stretched out arm, him shall ye fear, and him shall ye worship, and to him shall ye do sacrifice. So here it's specifically referring to when God brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, the, the, the plagues and all the, the miracles that God did. That's a perfect illustration of this because to one group of people, the Israelites, that power, that great power was fighting for them. It was on their side. It, it, it set them free. It, was, it, it did miracles for them. It, it changed their life for generations. But to the people who were in sin, to the people that were against God, that same great power was a curse to the Egyptians. So again, you have this, and this is a perfect example of this, where you have God doing a great miracle, using his, utilizing his infinite power in an area into the people that were on the right side of that power. It was a great blessing. But to those who were against God, it was, it was a great curse. So we know that we're inferior to God and not just knowledge but in power. So let's make sure that we, are, we fear that power and we're on the right side of it right. as Christians. Go back to Job 38. So we are inferior to God. The first area is in knowledge. The second area is in power. Third this evening, we are inferior to the Lord in dependence. What do I mean by that? I mean that we are inferior to the Lord in that we depend on him. Everything depends on him. Look at verse 41. Here's the third point God's making to Job here. Job 38, 41, God says, who provideth for the raven his food? When his young ones notice this cry unto God, they, won, they wonder, wander for lack of meat. Here God's saying even the birds cry to God, depend on the Lord for, for, their, for the next meal. The, all God's creation, the, perhaps the greatest way, salvation being the ultimate example of this, perhaps the, great, the, the greatest way that God is superior, superior to mankind is that in his creation, from mankind to the, to the birds, depend on God. For salvation, we depend on God because we are inferior to him. Turn to Job 12, we'll finish here. Job chapter number 12. Here's a beautiful example of this. Here, Job, is, Job actually says it perfectly here. here. It is towards the beginning of the book, and Job is analyzing his situation, and he says it perfectly. Look at verse 7. Job 12, verse 7. Here, here Job is analyzing his current situation. He says, But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. And do the fishes of the sea declare unto thee, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? Job is saying, you know, good or bad, I know that God has allowed this to happen in some way. God is in full control. And notice verse 10, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? You know, we ought to realize as, 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 just as not just as, as humans, but especially as saved believers that we are inferior to God in the fact that we depend on him for everything, from our salvation to having an everlasting life down to our next breath. So it's kind of the theme of this whole sermon, the same thing with the knowledge and same thing with the power. In general, in our lives, regardless of what area it's in, let's make sure that you know, God, God wants us to depend on him. This is not a burden on God. This is God wants us to pray to him. He wants us to depend on him for everything. Let's use that. Let's use that. Let's, let's understand that, you know, we are inferior, inferior to God. But what does that mean? Specifically, what does that mean that God is omnipotent and all-powerful? It means that he is able to protect us. He's able to give us knowledge. He's able to, to be there for us. So we ought to depend on that. 
We ought to depend on that and not turn to the world or other sources for anything and understand that God is in full control and that God is the one we should depend on for every area of our life. Let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, thank you uh, for this church, Lord. Thank you for this man's preaching tonight. I pray you be with the next preacher as he comes up to preach, Lord, and bless the fellowship to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Brother Luke. All right, guys. So, um... The title of my sermon right here, the title uh, is called The God We Serve. So real quickly, I'm going to kind of blast through these things because I don't want to run out of time and like, you know, be a little red in the face and everything. So here in Psalm 2, it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. I think that this is a, uh, a picture of a, of a battle to come later on, uh, Gog and Magog kind of thing, you know, and uh, it's just uh, another example of uh, 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 an army that the world has never seen. Almost all of the nations, all these wicked people uh, from all over the world are going to come together and try to fight God, which right here, uh, right here in um, verse 1 of Psalm 2, it says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The vain thing that they're imagining is that they're even a chance for God. Now, how can they even, you know, I, this, the, the vanity of man, you know, to think that they can even stand up to him, that he can, that he would even flinch. He laughs, in fact, at this, at this. And uh, over here in um, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, it says, uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. In old times, a train of a, of a, of a royal king or king, queen's garment would be like a symbol of, of, of power, of, uh, of royalty. Of, um, uh, it, was, uh, it was just a, a symbol of how, how much glory that they had in their, in their kingship, in their, in, their, uh, in their royalty, I guess. You know what I mean? But... Uh, this vision, the train is filling this whole temple. His glory is filling this whole temple. And it says, and it's and it stood ab uh, uh, about above it. It's uh, it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. These seraphims are angels. These angels, you know, obviously they they dwell in in heaven, and uh, even in their in their design, God designed them to wear they even even because they're creatures remember they're not god they're not eternal so the even these beings need some sort of built-in um fail safe if you will to protect them from the glory of god the, they, they have wings covering their face just like how moses could only look at the backside of god they built into their design there's this there's this shield to keep them from from uh just in, being disintegrated by the glory of god you know what i mean i thought that was pretty awesome in itself. And over here in Daniel 2, uh, verses 20 to 22, it says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. So, you know, this is when um, Daniel's praying to, uh, to get uh, insight on the, on the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, you know, so, um, so the wise men of that uh, nation aren't killed by Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, he's, he gets the answer from God, and then he's kind of praising God, you know, like, and right here is just another reminder that, God's in charge. God has his hand on all things, and, um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're doing right, if you're doing what you ought to be doing, then, you know, God will obviously bless the things that you do, and he'll answer the prayers that you're, that you're praying. Amen. And then over here in uh, the book of Acts, Acts 17, 23 to uh, 31, real quickly, this is uh, Paul when he's in uh, Athens at, at Mars Hill, and he's, uh, he sees this, 
this statue, right, uh, of this unknown God, and it says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that hath made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So Paul is kind of setting these guys straight, you know, you superstitious goofballs. Like, do you think, do you think, you know, you're uh, making this statue to this unknown God, just so you don't miss any, you know what I mean? Just so you, let's just, you know, make another uh, image, you know, but obviously God doesn't want us to make images. He doesn't want us to pray to images. He doesn't want us to give glory to images. He wants us to give glory to him. The only thing worthy of praise, the only thing worthy of worship is him. He has, uh, he has uh, the, uh, the existence is only, can only be because of God. God has the power of existence in himself. That's why He's outside of time, space, matter. He's outside of the, out of the foundations of reality that we're all uh, stuck in, that we're all um, in. Uh, we have to abide by these laws of reality, these laws of physics, of, uh, of life, and God is outside of that. That's how big he is. He's, he's the founder of this. You know what I'm saying? He's the founder of existence in itself because in himself is existence. Can existence even exist? You know what I mean? kind of a profound thing, kind of ties in with the I am that I am, you know, a profound statement that only he can make. And uh, over here in uh, Revelation, I like this image, uh, this, not this image, but this picture, rather. Revelation 19, uh, verses, um, verses 11 through 16, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, that's the God we serve. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Lord God, we thank you for the glory and the might that is found in you, the strength that we find from your great comforter and the gift of salvation that you gave for us, the price that you paid. And we're just, we're always in thanks. We're always in, um, in gratitude for the things that you've done for us, Lord God, every blessing, every chastisement. And uh, I pray that you're with the next speaker tonight. And uh, I, I pray that you bless the, uh, the fellowship to come. In the Lord Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. amen. And the next one, Trevor. All right, please turn your Bibles to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Uh, just kind of want to start out by the, the, the idea that came for this sermon. Um, reading through James chapter 4, my wife and I recently, uh, earlier this month, we actually celebrated our 10th year wedding anniversary. So we went to the coast and uh, took the kids and kind of just spent time together and drove over there enjoying the kids, enjoying each other. Kids could play in the sand. And when we were driving, when the kids were sleeping, you know, we started reminiscing. Uh, oh, remember when we got married? Remember our honeymoon? Remember the day we got married? Remember, uh, remember when he was born? Remember when she was born? You know, remember all these life events that we've gone through. And we've only been married 10 years, and that's, that's not a lot. I know there's m multiple people in this room that have been married for longer than that. 
But I would encourage if you're, if you're in that situation to take time to remember, take time to reminisce. And in doing that, uh, and reading, our Bi- reading my Bible, this, this verse, this set of verses in James chapter 4 came to mind. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Look down at James chapter 4 and verse 13. The Bible says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. The title of this sermon is, Life's Too Short. You know, looking back at these pictures, and, and we pull up our pictures and look at, oh, wow, when, when our first was born, and look at how little he is, and look at how much he's grown, look at, you know, oh, this is when we first moved into our house, and different things. And sometimes it seems to go so fast. When you look back, it seems, man, that was just yesterday. That was last year. No, that was 10 years ago. That was five years ago. Life does go by fast. And what I want to talk about tonight is things that we can get maybe wrapped up in, especially in 2023 America, uh, that life is too short to get wrapped up in these things. So the first part I want to make is life's too short to spend it chasing dumb things or things that don't matter. Right? The world has an agenda that they say we should chase. Uh, success in business, success in life means uh, he that dies with the most has the most things. That's, that's not what the Bible says. Right? That's a foolish ambition to chase. Covetousness, the lust of this flesh, the lust of this life, alcohol, drugs, all these things, these sins that can, that, that you know, in 2023 America, it's, it's all about stuff. It's all about covetousness. Right? Life is too short to spend it chasing these things. Hebrews 11 and 25, I'll just read for you, talking about Moses. It says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There is some pleasure in sin for a season, but life's too short to waste it pursuing that pleasure. There is much more, much better things, especially as saved Christians, there's much better things that we should be doing with our time. Everybody on their deathbed, nobody on their deathbed thinks back over their life Oh man, I wish I would have taken that, taken that, uh, taken that uh, promotion at work. I wish I would have been able to buy a Bugatti, right? I, nobody, I wish nobody says that at the end of their, at the end of their life. They're focusing on, wow, I wish I would have been there for my kids more. I wish I would have been more involved in my family. I wish I would have been more involved in church. Amen? Amen. Life's too short to spend life chasing things that don't matter. The second thing I want to talk about is life's too short to spend it being stressed or anxious or discontented angry all the time, bitter all the time. Life's too short to spend it with these feelings. I want to preface this by saying there is, a, there is a time and we should have righteous anger towards certain things. We should have wrath towards certain things. We should have righteous jealousy towards certain things. But life's too short to spend it focused on that all the time. In this room, we're talking to a group of saved people, right? If everything in our life goes, goes bad, if from this point on, everything is terrible the rest of our life, and we die, and we go to heaven, it's still good. We don't deserve anything good in this life. God promises that we'll have food and raiment, and with therewith, we should be content, right? God has a lot of things for us to do on this earth, but we ought to remember, it's good to be, it's good to have righteous anger, it's good to have wrath towards certain things, it's good to be righteously jealous to your spouse, to uh, those that need to be jealous over, but we ought not spend our lives in that state. Turn to Philippians chapter 4, please. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. I'll read for you out of 1 Peter 5. Verse 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. When it says there, your care, it's not talking about um, the thing, like if, uh, say, somebody, that a nurse would care for a sick patient. They're tending to their needs. Or It's not talking about, uh, us tending towards God's needs. That, that is what we should do, but this verse specifically in context is talking about the things that we have concern about. Our concerns, our worries, our anxieties, our, the things that we're preoccupied with. It says, Cast all, casting all your cares or your concerns upon him, for he careth for you. That's a good point. The maker, the creator of heaven and earth, as, as Job said, he is all powerful. He cares for you as an individual. He has your best interest in mind for your life so that you could be an optimal server for him in his kingdom, for the furtherance of his kingdom. That's what our job is to do as Christians, is to serve Christ and spread the gospel, right? Philippians chapter 4. If we're spending our life stressed, anxious, discontented with things, angry, bitter, 
We're not going to be effective in doing that. First Corinthians, uh, first, uh, excuse me, Philippians chapter 4. If you're there, look down at verse 6. Be careful for nothing. This is a command, and again here, careful is not talking about, you know, don't care about your personal safety, run into the burning building. This is talking about the things that you care about, the concerns you have. Be concerned about nothing. Don't worry about things. But in everything, all the things that we would be concerned with, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Notice verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. A lot of times that the peace of God, which passeth understanding, that's referred to, people will say that if somebody loses a loved one or is, is experiencing a troubling time. And that peace of God, that, that fits in that application. But specifically in the context of these two verses, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, that's an if-then statement. So verse 6 is a command, be careful for nothing. And then it tells us how to do that. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, that part is important, let your request be made known unto God. So if we're anxious about things, if we're stressed about things, if we're overwhelmed with anger, with bitterness, whatever, the command is there to be careful for nothing. How do we do that? By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. If we're successfully doing verse 6, verse 7 is a promise. And if you do this, and the peace of God, which passeth understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So if we're stressed or if we're having anxiety about things and we're maybe discontent with certain things and how we are in our lives, where we're at today, what, whatever the case may be, we must not be doing verse 6 correctly. Life's too short to spend it being stressed out, to, to be worried about things, to be uh, consumed with anger, consumed with bitterness. There's a lot of things in this world to be angry about. There's a lot of things in this world to have wrath over. But we ought not let it drive our life. There's too many good things in this life. We have salvation, right? If we have salvation, the rest of our life, like I said earlier, could go down the road. And, and if we die and go to heaven, praise God, it's good, right? John 10, 10. I, I actually, while you're there in Philippians 4 and verse 6, Notice in verse 11, it says, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith be, to be content. It's a learned process. He has learned this by doing verse 6 and receiving the promise of verse 7. We can apply that to our lives as well. Life's too short to not have an abundant life as a Christian. John 10.10, 10, I'll just read for you. It says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I, Jesus Christ, am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. This abundant Christian life, we get saved there's a lot of things to do on our plate. God commands us as men to provide for our own families, to love our, our wives as Christ loved the church. He commands us to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're supposed to read our Bible every day. We're supposed to pray. We're supposed to be in church when the doors are open, right? There's a lot of things to do on the Christian's plate. My son, in, in the springtime, uh, we were driving tractor, and I was kind of showing him how to drive tractor. And we rent a tractor. It's a 500-horsepower tractor. It's a big tractor. And what we do with that tractor is we pull a a chisel or a ripper. So it's a shank that's about 20 inches down that goes into the soil, rips up the soil, breaks up the compaction layers. It's a heavy load to pull that chisel. If you're pulling a lighter load, you upshift a couple gears, you down the throttles, you're more efficient on fuel. But on a heavy load, you got to give it all the beans. You got to give it wide open throttle. In this Christian life, we got a lot of things to do. Life is too short to spend it on foolish things, to spend it worried and anxious, and life's too short to not give it all the beans in this Christian life. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to preach. Uh, thank you for all the people in this room. Uh, we ask that you would bless the next preacher and uh, keep our hearts and minds open to your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Brother Max. Turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 14, please. Book of Ezekiel in the major prophets in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 14. Um, and what I want to talk about this evening is, is a phrase that's found here in Ezekiel 14. Uh, it says, the idol in their heart. And I, obviously as Christians, and one of the Ten Commandments, we're not supposed to make idols, we're not supposed to worship other gods, but something that I think can get overlooked by a lot of Christians is an idol in their heart, something else that's distracting them from God, distracting them from the full potential of, of service to God. Um, and I want to look at that here real quick. So look down at Ezekiel 14 in verse 1. It says, Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, 
These men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. So look at what God is saying here. God is saying these people, they've set up an idol in their heart, even if they're still coming to worship him, you know, even if it's a Christian and they're still coming to church, they still have all the outward signs, but they have an idol in their heart where there's something else that's taken their affection, taken the place of God in their life. God says, should I answer them? Should I be inquired of it all by them? They're coming to church still, but why should I talk to them? Why should I answer them if they've got an idol in their heart? So God takes this, this is a big deal to God, and you say, okay, well, what is an idol in your heart? Well, it's just an idol. It's something that you worship in your life, something that you devote more time, more effort, more love uh, towards than God, something that you trust more than God, anything that takes the place of God in your life. And I want to give you some, some common examples of that. I'm sure we can all think of some, but what's a big one? Money. A lot of people are way into money, and that's what they're trusting. They're, you know, they just say, well, I got my savings, and I got all these stocks, and I got X, Y, and Z. I'm going to be fine if there's a recession or if there's this or whatever. There are a lot of people that are trusting money. And as we know, the love of money is the root of all evil. And you're not supposed to. Don't let money become an idol in your heart. Someone where, and I'm sure we've met these people us men who go out to work, if you meet the guy who's just a workaholic and he's just out there because he loves money and he wants to make as much of it as possible and he wants to be a millionaire, that shouldn't be us as Christians. Another, another common one that, that you see is a career or a job where this becomes the, an idol in someone's life where they say, I couldn't move. I can go to a good, a good church. What about my career? What about my job? I couldn't do this. You know, they, I can't sacrifice anything for God. I need to work on Sundays. That's what my job is telling me and their career and their job becomes more important in their life and takes that position of preeminence in our life where God should be number one Amen. and it becomes their job, it becomes their career and that should not be us as Christians. Look, if you have, I get it, if you occasionally gotta work Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday night, whatever, but it shouldn't be like, oh, I'd rather work on Sunday because I wanna make money or because that's what my job tells me I have to do. You should love God and not let this your career, your job creep in as an idol into your heart. This is another one. This is really funny. I have a great example of this from Soul Winning today. Sports. Okay, this is probably the dumbest one that I thought of on this list. And you say, what? Brother Max, there are Christians who make sports an idol in their life? Oh, yeah. Brother Benjamin and I ran to the guy today at the door, and it's like, we're coming from Hold Fast Baptist Church. You know, are you 100% sure you're on your way to heaven? He's like, yeah, I'm 100% sure. Oh, well, how do you know? Oh, I'm watching the game right now. It's really important. I got to go. That guy, look, if he's saved, great, but he's got sports as an idol in his life that he can't stop and talk to two other fellow Christians. Yeah, yeah. He's got, it's, that gentleman has sports as an idol in his life, and that is not something any of us should have. Whether you play it, whether you follow a team, whatever, don't let sports become an idol in your life. And then kind of the last the last thing or, or area that I, I thought of where people kind of create an idol in their heart is with other people or other relationships in their life. You know, if, if there's, you know, uh, whether it's, it's, you know, your spouse or somebody else, obviously we're supposed to love our family and, and our spouse and all of that, but you can't let other people in your life, you can't, and this could be some celebrity too. People get that way as well, but for us in this room, it's more applicable that you need to put God first in everything. You can't let somebody else, anybody else, even if you love them and they're saved or, you know, you can't let anybody else in your life take that spot of preeminence that God should have in your life. And don't let an idol creep into your heart. Don't let an idol creep into your heart. So we kind of saw what is an idol in your heart? What are some common areas? And I'm sure we've seen this in different people's lives, maybe in our own lives as well to varying degrees. But now, What's the remedy for this? What does God say about it? Look down again at Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14, in verse 5, it says, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your heart, your faces, from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, verse 7, 
or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me, and setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire by him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself, and I will set my face against that man, and I will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Does it sound like God takes this pretty seriously? Yeah. yeah. God's not playing around. And if you don't put God in the position that he deserves in your life, if you don't give him the worship that he deserves, if you got something else that has your affection, that has your heart, so to speak, if you have an idol in your heart, God is going to have to forcefully remove that. What does he say? Look at, uh, what was it, the end of verse 8, where he says, I will set my face against that man, and I will cut him off. You don't want that. God will remove you, and your life will, will, will not be good when God has to forcefully put himself back where he belongs in that place of preeminence as the priority in your life. It's always better to just keep him there. Don't let anything else get to that spot. And God, I mean, God warned them about this in Deuteronomy 11. You don't have to turn there back in the, in the law. God told them, take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, and then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, unless you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. So God takes this seriously. If you worship, and obviously the application back in Deuteronomy was to physical idols, but for us as Christians, you know, and obviously this all applies to having a physical idol or, or something, in, you know, Hindus worshiping, you know, idols. But us as Christians don't think that we also can't let something creep into that position of being an idol in our heart because it definitely can. And we've seen it with people. So don't, don't let an idol creep into your heart because God takes it very seriously. And I don't think any of us want to get to the point where God is saying, I'll cut him off because, you know, because we've gotten so far into that. Always just keep your heart tender, examine your heart, make sure God is at that number one place, that he has that number one spot in your life. And if you do have an idol in your heart, and, you know, we've, we've different, you know, maybe you've been at a place where you've had that. I know for me it was, you know, always like my car, my truck, you know, or whatever. And it's like that can get to a spot where it's like I'm spending way too much time and money and just I'm thinking about it too much, and it's becoming an idol and it's taking away my time and my love and my affection for the Lord. Don't let that happen. And if you have that, get out of your heart. Get out of your heart. It's so much easier than these alternatives that we see in Ezekiel 14 and in Deuteronomy where God's saying, I'll cut you off from the good land. Like, you, I'll, no more blessings if you don't get your heart right, if you don't get rid of that idol in your heart. So don't let it creep in. Examine your heart tonight. And just to close, 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says, Therefore, dear, my dearly beloved, Flee from idolatry. And again, if we needed any more emphasis on idolatry being bad, don't let it creep into your heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your word, Lord. I pray none of us would let any idols or anything creep into our heart that would take away our love and our affection for you, Lord. And please bless the other preachers this evening and the fellowship to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother George. <laughs> All right, turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Uh, we're going to start off in verse 16. The Bible reads there, it says, uh, They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. Uh, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that, newly, that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that beget thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. I just want to kind of just set the stage here. Ezekiel 8, verse 16, the Bible says, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, 
were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and they and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east now what I want to focus on today is tonight <clears throat> is the fact that many if not all religions outside of the Bible are pagan so if they don't believe the Bible and the God of the Bible then they're a pagan religion uh, they're there so if you reject Christ then your default setting is Satan okay so they're Luciferian satanic Baal worship uh, Sun and moon and planet worship okay so uh, Satan makes all these pagan religions look uh, appealing on the outside but uh, down to the core it's all the same Baal Sun moon planet worship uh, you know, he's done it from the beginning. Yeah, hath the Lord, yeah, hath God said. You know, God doesn't want us to have other gods besides him. Um, he, Satan said, I will be like the Most High. And um, <clears throat> Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, Mormonism, Freemasons, uh, Muslim, Islam, Judaism. Catholicism, they're, they're all the same. They're all the same in some form uh, or some way. So 2 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 14, it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore there is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So uh, let's take, for example, let's take uh, Islam, Muslims. So um, if you just look up in Wikipedia, you just type in list of occult symbols, all these symbols will pop up, right? And, um, and you know, Muslims are in there. This is their symbol here. Moon and pinnacle. And these are occult symbols, both of these. And um, Allah, it, you could read about it. It says, Allah is a moon god who married the sun god. So moon, this is the sun, moon, the pinnacle. And this pagan religion, you know, corresponds to Baal worship, sun and moon worship. And it has 1.9 billion followers with a B. Okay. So let's go. You could turn there if you want. Uh, 2 Kings 23, uh, 23 and verse 5. And uh, King Josiah did this. He's a good king. Um, we won't get into details, but it's, it reads, And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah. And in the places round about Jer Jerusalem, uh, them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the hosts of heaven. So, you know, I'm not making this up. You guys can do your own research. Um, but, you know, the Bible speaks for itself. Um, another example, let's just, you know, keep it with what's going on today. Israel. Israel uses a hexagram, which is a, which is on the list of occult symbols. Uh, when you look it up on Wikipedia, even Wikipedia knows this. Um, so they say this is uh, the Star of David, and they say they worship the God that David worships. That's not true. There is no Star of David. Uh, the Bible's. Uh, the Bible talks about a star of Remphan, who is a pagan god. It corresponds to Molech, Baal, Saturn worship. There's planet worship. Um, they reject Christ, too. So their default setting is Satan. Um, this religion has 14 million followers. It's probably way more than that. Uh, go, to, go to Acts chapter 7. And verse 42, 
The Bible reads, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifice by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yeah. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So this is uh, Stephen's sermon. Uh, it's a great sermon if you've ever read that. Um, you know, Stephen is calling them out for their idolatry, and then uh, they stone Stephen. And if you go down to verse 59, Acts 7, 59, it says, and they stoned Stephen. So they killed Stephen. And Stephen, when were, they were stoning him, he called upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, Jesus is God, receive my spirit. You know, so both of these, both, both of these religions are pagan religions, and they're Christ-rejecting, default-setting Satan. Deuteron uh, go to Deuteronomy, well, you're already, well, go to Deuteronomy 32. Um, Deut Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4, the Bible reads, He is the rock, talking about Jesus, same God in the Old Testament. Jesus is the same God in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. He is the rock. His work is perfect, and for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So all that to say that we should be thankful that we worship the one and true God. You know, two billion people and what is there, like 40 people in this room? You know, your chances are pretty slim you know, if you're going to get saved. And we're all pretty lucky to be saved. We should be thankful every single day. Um, you know, we should be thankful so much that we should go and uh, preach the gospel because Jesus commanded us to preach the gospel. Once you're saved, you shouldn't just run away with uh, the gift. Everybody should go and preach the gospel. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter who, who you are. You learn the Bible. You know, I wasn't always a soul winner. I had to study the Bible. It took time for me to study the Bible. And, but practice, repetition, you, you become a good soul winner if you just keep at it. So turn uh, to Mark chapter 16. And we're going to end here. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, 15 through 16. And he said, this is Jesus talking, Unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, this is key right here. This is why we should go soul winning. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Do you, do you guys want two billion people to go to hell? Because I don't. So I'm going to keep soul winning. I'm going to keep coming in church. You know, I want, you know, today was a great day soul winning. Today was a great day soul winning. And um, let's go ahead and bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you for uh, this church. Um, I, I want to thank you for soul winning. Um, I just, this church has done so much for me, Lord. Uh, so thankful that you sent uh, pastor and his family here uh, to teach us the Bible. Uh, I will always forever be thankful. I'm never going to leave this church, Lord, until the day I die. And um, I just can't say it enough. Thank you, Lord. And just bless everybody here. Um, bless this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.